I think we're going to get started now. I mean, people will be coming back from lunch. It's my pleasure to introduce the next panel that's going to be moderated by, the, by Dr. Yifang Lavin from the School of Medicine, as well as Dr. Sirank Rikorian from the Department of Epibiostat at the School of Medicine. And they'll be giving a global, global perspective about some of the collaborative studies. So Yifang and Siran. Thank you, George. I'm Yifan Glavin, and faculty of family medicine and community health, also a senior scholar at uh, Taiwan Medical University. Uh, the first government-approved uh, Taiwan National Health Insurance Data Center is established at the TMU. Uh, so November 2012, uh, which is uh, you know, just uh, four months ago, and CASE and uh, TMU signed agreement in terms of explore the possibilities of using large data analysis and to support uh, healthcare delivery and research. Uh, in the past few months, and I think we uh, decide we want to uh, start to work on that data and get to know the data on each side. So we pick up two topics, and uh, epilepsy and prostate cancer, and to uh, demonstrate and uh, explore the possibilities of working together. So in this uh, uh, afternoon section, I would like to introduce both the uh, the investigators from the TMU as well as the uh, case side, and uh, so they can present the data they put together. And uh, so let me start to introduce the TMU uh, investigators, and then I introduce uh, the case in uh, investigators, and uh, and you know, and rather than introduce them separately, that and that will save a lot of time. So you guys can have more time for presentation. So on the CM side and. Uh, Dr. Uh, Lin Nian uh, Chien, and uh, is Assistant Professor, School of Healthcare Administration and Research Fellow of Health and Clinical Research Data uh, Center. Uh, Yan Lin Huang, Dr. Huang, uh, Assistant Professor, School of Gerontology, Health Management, and also the uh, College of Nursing. And uh, Dr. Ye Jian De, who is the Chief of the Department of Urology, Taipei Medical University Hospital, Assistant Professor at School of Medicine, Taipei uh, TMU, and also Joint Assistant Research Fellow uh, at the Ac Academia Sinica in Taiwan, which is a very highly respected organization. On the CSU side, uh, on, the, on the Case Western University uh, side, our colleague Robert um, Abu Asley and Dr. Asley is Assistant Professor, Urology Institute, University Hospital, Case Medical School. And uh, Kitty, uh, Dr. Kitty Kaburinvo, and uh, uh, he's an assist professor in neurology and epilepsy center and UH Case Medical Center. And lastly, my, my uh, co uh, mon uh, co uh, moderator, uh, Sirang, uh, Dr. Karokio, is associate professor, Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics uh, School of Medicine. So uh, we probably start to share the comparative study report on epilepsy first. So if I, we can have the uh, case and uh, TMU investigators and doing a co-presentation. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Kitty Kaiboribun from um, University Hospital, and um, I'm Lei Nianzhen from the TMU. So what we're going to talk today is about epilepsy project um, that um, Um, that we collaborate between um, CASE and Taipei Medical University. Um, first, I would like to um, thank to um, Asperia who helped produce all of the data that you will see today um, with the help from Paul and other people in the group. And I also want to thank uh, two of my members, Lin Chen and Hong Yi Liu, and all to the neurologists in Taiwan uh, TMU. 
So epilepsy is a chronic disorder um, characterized by recurrent seizure. You basically have to have two seizures before you can be diagnosed with epilepsy. And epilepsy is a heterogeneous um, disease. So that means that um, there are several types of uh, epilepsy. And you will be surprised from the presentation today that there are other epilepsy is a very heterogeneous disease. Um, overall epilepsy population, they are very similar. Um, epilepsy associated with several comorbid conditions, especially psychiatric disorder, traumatic brain injury, stroke, and brain tumor. Some of the disease um, cause epilepsy, and some of uh, people with epilepsy develop several diseases after they get diagnosed with epilepsy. And epilepsy cause a lot of problems in terms of um, financial burden and um, to the individual family and the society. Um, in the U.S., the estimated annual direct cost for epilepsy is about $9.6 billion per year. This does not include costs um, from community service or other indirect costs, especially from loss in quality of life and productivity, uh, which are the major um, component of the burden of epilepsy. And epilepsy um, is also associated with substantially um, higher rates of mortality. And from our previous analysis, people with epilepsy lost about 17 years of life. The objective of this project is to uh, first um, determine the incidence and prevalence of epilepsy in Taiwan and in Ohio Medicaid population and to compare the occurrence of comorbid conditions between Taiwanese and Ohio Medicaid beneficiaries with epilepsy. We use um, Medicaid analytic extract on MAX-5 from 2005 to 2008 uh, for Ohio Medicaid. Um, we exclude those who enroll in managed care program, Medicare program, or spend out program. And uh, for Taiwan, um, we use national health insurance data between 2005 to 2008, and this data cover 99% um, of um, population in Taiwan. We first uh, define epilepsy case by, because um, we use administrative data, so the only, all of the data we have is all claims data. So um, bef before, we diagnose them with epilepsy, we need at least one visit with epilepsy diagnosis or at least two or more visits for um, seizure diagnosis because you need to have at least two seizures to be diagnosed epilepsy. And then we um, identify the index date and after the index date, they need to have at least one more of the epilepsy or seizure diagnosis. They need to have um, at least two um, AED claims that are at least 30 days apart. So these criteria are quite strict. Um, for Taiwan National Health Insurance data, we need at least seven days just because of the practice pattern in Taiwan. Um, the medication usually prescribe um, seven days. So everybody who meet the epilepsy case definition were identified as prevalent cases. Those um, incident cases are those who actually enroll in the Medicaid for at least three years without any um, epilepsy or seizure claims before the epilepsy index date. And because we need to have at least three years of enrollment, then the Incident case were identified only in 2008. Um, again, this is just a scheme to show that, this, that we used um, the data from January 2005 to December 2008. Um, for incident case, they need to have at least three years of enrollment without epilepsy or seizure related diagnosis, and the incident case were identified in 2008. We also identify comorbid conditions in people with epilepsy. For incident case, any comorbid conditions that identify before epilepsy diagnosis are labeled as pre-existing conditions. Uh, since in Taiwan we use the journal population, so I will start first. 
So uh, in Taiwan, from uh, the the population in two thousand uh, five is we have an even kind of uh, even distribution between male and female. For the age distribution from ninety to uh, sixty four, uh, we uh, the majority of person is aged uh, around twenty uh, five to uh, fifty four. And uh, we also uh, use um, the monthly premium to define what's their uh, ability to pay for their health insurance. So in Taiwan, we have around 1.5%. They pay zero premium for their uh, monthly, uh, for their health insurance. Unfortunately, you cannot see the 1.5% here. It's very important because um, we use Ohio Medicaid in order to compare. So we try to match these two population uh, with the people in Taiwan. So for us, um, it looks pretty um, similar in terms of the age distribution um, and sex distribution. Obviously, the majority of people in um, Medicaid um, are white and very small number of them are um, others which include Asian. Uh, there was a graphic here, which unfortunately you can't see, but basically it shows the prostate cancer incidence worldwide. And uh, if you could see it, you would see that in North America, the incidence is quite high, about 150 uh, cases per 100,000 um, uh, population compared to Asia, which has an incidence which is much lower. If you look at the incidence over time, again, you see that uh, there was a spike in the incidence of prostate cancer in North America right around 1990, early 90s, and that was mostly attributed to the use of prostate cancer uh, screening uh, during that time, the availability of the PSA blood test. And since then, there's been a dec slight decline in the incidence of prostate cancer in North America, uh, ending right about 150 cases per 100,000. The incidence, again, there's another graphic here, which you're supposed to see, but um, it shows uh, the uh, breakdown of the incidence rates by ethnicity in North America. Uh, so, uh, for example, Caucasians have an incidence of about 144 per 100,000, compared to African Americans, which have a much higher incidence at 228 per uh, 100,000, so about 50% higher incidence of prostate cancer. Uh, and Asians living in, in North America have a lower uh, incidence than both African Americans and Caucasians at 81 cases per 100,000. Okay, this slide shows the uh, Asia uh, area. And uh, in the Asia area, the, uh, if uh, in the more developed country like Taiwan, Japan, and North, uh, South Korea, and Singapore, the incidence rate is higher. It's uh, about uh, 20 to 23 uh, per 100,000 pa per population. And uh, other country in Asia is lower than 10. And since we have the uh, cancer research data from the 1979, so this picture just shows the uh, case from the 1979 to 2010, the, the case number was increased in Taiwan. The, uh, we, uh, the reason why it increased so uh, rapidly is why is because uh, since the 1995, uh, we set up the national health insurance. So from that point, the case increased. And we have the cancer, uh, cancer control egg. Uh, initiate in 2003, so and the uh, older population increased very rapidly. So all the f uh, factor uh, just uh, contributes to the case. And till the uh, 2010, the case number in Taiwan is 4,396. 
And uh, we also looked at the distribution of incident cases by age, both in uh, Ohio using SEER data and in Taiwan. And of course, the Ohio SEER data, data are quite similar. And in fact, even in Taiwan, the age distribution of the incident cases is quite similar to what we see in North America. Uh, perhaps a slightly uh, higher number, proportion of patients in the 70 to 79 group uh, 70 to 79 years of age group in Taiwan compared to North America, but overall the age distribution is quite similar between the two uh, countries. But what was interesting is when we looked at the stage at presentation uh, and we compared Taiwan to North America, we see that Taiwan had a uh, much lower proportion of localized disease. Um, it was 36% uh, localized disease at presentation in Taiwan compared to 81% in North America. So there was uh, quite a difference. Um, also, the uh, proportion of patients with metastatic disease at presentation was much higher in Taiwan. It was 18.9% compared to 3.3% uh, in Ohio. Um, there, there was uh, an issue in, in Taiwan, there's about 27% of patients that don't have stage information, um, which again uh, can affect the data somewhat, but can't explain the differences that we've observed, observed compared to 6.7% unstaged in uh, Ohio. We also looked at the distribution uh, by stage, by age and stage, and as patients get older, they tend to present with more uh, advanced disease, so more regional and uh, metastatic disease, and also the proportion of patients who present with unstaged disease tends to be higher in patients of advanced age compared to younger patients. And that's uh, true both in Taiwan and in North America. Uh, we also looked at the mor uh, mortality rate using SEER uh, in North America, and there's been a decline in the mortality of prostate cancer since 1990, um, a, a fairly uh, dramatic decline by about a third. Um, so the mortality rate overall is about uh, 23 per 100,000. Uh, again, there's a race uh, difference here in North America, so that Caucasians have a, a, a mortality rate of 21 uh, per 100,000 compared to African Americans uh, that have a mortality rate of 51 per 100,000. Asians in North America have a mortality rate of 10.1, so again, lower than uh, Caucasians here. And in Taiwan, the 2008, the incidence rate is about 20 per 100,000, and the mortality rate is about uh, 6.7 per 100,000. So the incidence rate is uh, lower than uh, North America, and the mortality, mortality rate is uh, also lower than the, uh, North America. However, what was interesting is the mortality uh, rate to incident rate ratio uh, was higher in Taiwan than in North America, which means that of those diagnosed with prostate cancer, uh, you know, more of them appear to be uh, dying of prostate cancer in Taiwan compared to North America. And there are various potential explanations for that. So in summary, we found important differences in prostate cancer incidence and stage at presentation. The higher incidence in the U.S. than in Asia and Taiwan can be explained by various uh, things, such as perhaps uh, differences in reporting between the two countries, uh, differences in screening practices also may play an important role, where in North America we may be using more PSA screening testing and therefore perhaps detecting more cancer at earlier stage, or perhaps even uh, detecting uh, clinically insignificant cancer uh, in, in more patients here. Also, there's some important dietary differences between the two countries. Uh, more, uh, you know, a higher animal fat diet here in North America compared to a plant-based diet in, in uh, Asia. However, we did detect a lower proportion of patients dying of prostate cancer in the U.S. compared to Asia. Um, and uh, <clears throat> we found an earlier stage at disease presentation in the U.S. compared to Taiwan as well. And we'd like to explore those in more detail, to try to determine what, uh, why these differences uh, are present and what can explain them in future studies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So 
sorry about the power outage uh, in the back. Um, I just want to um, share with you some thoughts about the collaborative experience that we've had with TMU. Um, first of all, I would like to point out the similarities and differences in our data um, databases. Um, the, the databases actually are quite similar, both in structure and in content. Um, they both include billing data, so we can rely on diagnosis codes, on procedure codes, on um, drug codes as well in the future to do um, pharmacoepidemiologic studies. Um, so they're, they're quite similar in that way. Um, also, um, just as we do here, we need, you know, the, 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 the Taiwan system needs to integrate data from their cancer registry and from their death certificate if they want to um, look into more uh, granular and clinical data. We do have um, some differences between our uh, data sources. Um, so first of all, they don't have enrollment gaps, which is really fantastic, um, from, especially from a methodological standpoint. Um, let's just continue the old system here. Okay. Um, so in, in the, especially in the realm of Medicaid data, the enrollment gaps present huge challenges in methodology. We don't have that in the Medicare data, and we don't have that in the, in the Taiwan data. Um, and the, the greater advantage with the um, Taiwan data is that it encompasses all age groups, it encompasses all income levels, which is really wonderful. Um, and, and that's something we, we absolutely do not have. Uh, we do have some differences in the way we would identify um, low-income people um, in, in the presentations. I think you heard about how um, our collaborators from Taiwan went about to identify people with low incomes. Uh, they relied on the premium that is paid by the individual to identify them as low income. In our case, we, and I think Randy Siebel in his presentation pointed out that we rely on geocoded data to um, get census data at the census block group level to approximate that to the individual level um, data. So there are some differences like that. That's just one example, um, but, but they, they can really be overcome. Um, the other difference, um, and that's something that um, Taiwan data has, is that they have data on complementary and alternative medicine, so acupuncture, herbal medicine, et cetera. And, um, I know some people are very interested in looking at outcomes um, that are associated with that kind of therapy. However, they don't have data on long-term care. So uh, what we have done is um, we've done a lot of, um, <laughs> forget it, <laughs> thank you. Um, we, we've done a lot of um, what, what, what you just heard was um, epidemiological and descriptive studies just to set the stage for, for future studies. So uh, we started at the very basic level of looking at incidence and prevalence in our respective populations to understand their characteristics to, okay, fine. <laughs> Might as well. Um, Um, to assess their healthcare needs. Uh, we, all of this is really um, aiming to collect preliminary data in preparation for clinical trials or, or grant applications. Um, the side-by-side -side comparison is, uh, was really fascinating, especially in the case of um, prostate cancer, also in the case of epilepsy. So in the case of epilepsy, what was very interesting is that at the general level when we compared, we only have data on Ohio Medicaid, when we compared incidence and prevalence between Ohio Medicaid and the Taiwan population, and again, Taiwan includes all income levels, uh, then the difference was, was really staggering. But then when um, our, our collaborators from Taiwan just went down to the lowest income level, the incidence and prevalence came very, very close to what we observe in the Medicaid population, and that was something that, that was very interesting. And, um, Dr. Kai Boribon always said, you know, th these, these incidence and prevalence rates are, are very high, you know, is this correct? And, and so we had a, a validation of, of our studies in, from that perspective. So I think putting things side by side is really interesting and um, that, you know, it gives us an opportunity to look at things from another angle and, and, and really brainstorm on, on how to develop future studies in, in global health. Um, 
So is collaboration possible? Yes, it is possible, and it is also very promising. Um, this memorandum of understanding between the two universities was signed only a few months ago, and um, these, these two uh, studies developed just um, in, in that period of time. Uh, what we did is uh, we mutually agreed on the research question. We, defined, we, we agreed on how to define our study population. We agreed on how to define our variables, how to conduct the analysis. The analysis was conducted separately by the two teams, so there was no um, you know, IRB issues and entanglement in that regard. And, and then we brought the results together to, um, to compare, and, and that worked uh, really great. So we have a lot to learn from each other. Um, we gain a better understanding of the data by looking uh, from one side and then from the other. The interactive communication was just um, great. And there are many opportunities to collaborate. Um, they have some data that we don't have. We have some data that they don't have. But I think bringing together really uh, leverages both sources. And uh, there are great opportunities for hopefully joint grant applications and greater funding opportunities um, together. So I'd like to thank all of our collaborators, both from here and from Taiwan. Um, if the panel would like to come back for a uh, question and answer, answer session. Thank you. Uh, I wonder if um, uh, the neurologist could give us any speculation uh, about uh, why it is that the epilepsy rate is so much higher in the Taiwan population. Yes, um, there are several studies showing that there is some association between um, low socioeconomic status and epilepsy similar to several other diseases that, you know, poverty people tend to get several other diseases, maybe because of the behavior um, or maybe because of some other reason or maybe because um, they have some type of disease, for example, traumatic brain injury that make them unable to work. So they come in, in a loop, so a socioeconomic group, and then they develop epilepsy later. Um, so for epilepsy itself, they are very, uh, clear indication that um, socioeconomic status <laughs> is one of the risk factors for developing epilepsy. If, if I could ask it differently, is poverty incident or prevalent among epilepsy patients? Yes, right? Absolutely. There are some that to cite that bidirectional association between these um, low socioeconomic status and epilepsy because people who have epilepsy, they cannot work too. So you know, epilepsy itself also make people uh, poorer as well. We thought that the, uh, the prostate cancer um, data comparison yielded some very, very interesting results. Um, Dr. Ye, maybe you can comment on some of the differences and and why we were seeing the, um, the the stage differential that we observed. Thank you. Um, uh, at first, I want to thank you, uh, Professor uh, Wang and Professor Chu, to let me have this opportunity to join this research. Uh, as a clinician, I learn a lot from this kind of the population-based data analysis, and uh, we. Uh, we try to uh, apply this kind of study to to make some quality of care improvement in the prostate cancer in Taiwan. And uh, according to the data analysis, uh, it's quite interesting in, in Taiwan. Uh, we already know we have a more high-stage disease 
and also have a more high grace and score disease in Taiwan. Uh, one of the reasons uh, at the beginning, most of the uh, doctors in Taiwan think is because uh, a little delay for the diagnosis. So uh, always there a, a, a strong debate, a debate in Taiwan, a URG society to, to do screening or not to do screening for this kind of prostate cancer. And uh, another uh, important uh, question uh, uh, rising from this data analysis is we see a, a, a very high population of the unstaged the disease. I think uh, uh, maybe uh, 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 Professor Hong maybe uh, make some uh, comment about uh, what the so-called unstaged the disease. But uh, more interesting part is we also look at the uh, prognosis of this kind of population. Uh, we analyze one year and two years uh, survival uh, pattern and found it's very interesting this kind of unstaged disease quite similar to the distant disease. So uh, maybe this part is our effort to, came to improve the uh, prostate cancer survival in Taiwan for, for the, uh, in the future. So uh, we need to uh, more uh, carefully to, to stage this kind of population and make this population more clear about the background and also the layer, uh, basic geographic pattern and to how to looking for how to improve the care of this population. I think uh, P Professor Hong can explain uh, the unstaged, uh, what, what means of the unstaged in our database. Uh, in our in our data, that shows uh, about twenty five percent is unstaged, because in our system, the cancer reporting system, uh, the government thinks uh, the when the patient go to larger hospital, uh, when larger definition is the, if the case more than five hundred every year, then the hospital should report the stage system stage to the uh, cancer registry system. But if the patient go to the small hospital, then they do no need to report this data. So it's uh, why the unstage uh, proportion so high. But when we look into the, uh, all the, the, all the patient go to the large hospital, they're only 8% uh, of unstage but I think it's still higher than the Ohio data. Thank you for your uh, good question. In Taiwan, especially the older men, old, uh, Asian men, and most of the people are afraid of go to the great hospital, go to the big hospital. Uh, this uh, a cultural difference. The the people afraid when they go to the uh, hospital, they will be diagnosed with more severe disease. So they just design everything. Even they have a severe uh, low unit tract symptom, they think this is the aging process. They just tolerate this this uh, 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 severe symptom. So they make a diagnosis a, a little delayed compared with the, the U.S. I think we can improve the patient education, especially for let patient understand the low unit tract symptom may be one of the major symptoms in the Taiwan prostate cancer population. And we al also have some uh, cohort study to find that when uh, the patient diagnosis with prostate cancer, uh, around 70, 70% of the patient because of the last symptom. So it's a major uh, problem for the urological uh, association to, to make more education for this kind of population. Thank you. Uh, this question may be for Saran more than uh, the panel, um, but has there been discussion about comparison of um, uh, the Taiwanese population with U.S. Um, uh, born Asians, immigrant Asians in Ohio uh, to, uh, to see what extent uh, 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 ethnicity or culture may play a role in, in these diseases? Well, we, uh, we 
didn't have data on stage by race and ethnicity. We, uh, we, we need to, to look at the literature more closely. But in terms of incidence, so if incidence in Asia in general is in the, you know, below 20 per 100,000, uh, for the Asian population in the US, it's about 80. So it's, it's, it's much higher than, than what is reported in Asia. Um, mortality uh, follows the same, the same pattern, coming closer to, to the US population. But um, I think it would be really interesting to look at stage as well to see whether so that, that kind of. Be important to differentiate absolutely. Asian born Americans and Asian immigrant Americans because of That's the true. immigrant effects. That's true, uh, yes. Uh, that Right. In other words, the immigrants have less exposure to right. the mm -hmm. risk factors that the U.S. layers on. Very true, yes. That's a study, yeah. Have there been any studies on the effect, if any, of the use of traditional Chinese medicine on, uh, your, on your populations, uh, specifically with severity of disease, metastasy, et cetera? Uh, in Taiwan patient, uh, if you look at the the, uh, the so-called national health insurance database, a very high population uh, people use Chinese herb medicine or so-called tra traditional Chinese treatment, including acupuncture and also some uh, Chinese rehabilitation therapy. But uh, we don't uh, go deep to see any linkage between the prostate cancer patient and the, this kind of the Chinese herb medicine. It's a great uh, suggestion. We can uh, go deep to see this kind of uh, any linkage between this. But in the practical part, in, in my uh, uh, daily practice, uh, still a small population of the prostate cancer patient they will just disappear after diagnosis, and maybe one year later they come back. The disease, the, the disease more progress, and the people say they just try some Chinese herb medicine, maybe in Taiwan or in, in China. Uh, so this is still a, a, a problem in Taiwan. Thank you all very much. a group called Ohio Health Data Symposium, and I hope you'll join it and use it as a place um, to uh, give suggestions, to connect with uh, other collaborators, to offer collaborations, to suggest better ways that we can network besides LinkedIn. I've got some ideas, but that was the easiest thing um, to get up and running. So we really do want to stay in touch with you and hear from you um, during the year. Now, uh, we will turn to our neighboring state. Kentucky has been recognized by the federal government as a national leader uh, in efforts to enhance the uh, safety and quality of healthcare by embracing the use of health information technology. 97% of pharmacies in the state uh, use e-prescribing, and primary care providers are also all receiving care summaries from specialists across the state. Pilot efforts are underway to exchange data with their cancer registry for, and for public health uh, syndromic surveillance. And Kentucky is also participating in a national test effort to exchange data across organizational and state boundaries. Our speaker today, Brennan O'Bannon, joined the Kentucky Department of Public Health in March of 2001 to deal with bioterrorism and emergency preparedness, where, among other things, he modernized paper-based communicable disease surveillance. He joined the Kentucky HIE in September of 2011 and is responsible for promoting collaboration between the Kentucky HIE and public health. As such, he's focused on implementing meaningful use stage one surveillance services for electronic laboratory reporting and syndromic surveillance. And under his leadership, Kentucky became the first exchange in the country to implement standardized cancer treatment reporting to their central cancer, cancer registry. Brendan is also a PhD candidate in epidemiology at the University of Louisville School of Public Health and in Louisville uh, School of Public Health and Information Sciences. The focus of his dissertation is metabolic syndrome and the identification and epidemiology of novel metabolic phenotypes. Please welcome Brendan O'Bannon.
timer started here because critical digits have been threatened if I go over. Um, let's see here. Uh, let me get this. So as a, as a point of disclosure, um, really what, what colors everything that I, I do with the Health Information Exchange is essentially I'm a, I'm a, a boots on the ground informatician with an epidemiologist interest in populations. And so <clears throat> what I've been um, hired by the HIE to do is to figure out how you repurpose health information exchange, i.e. this exchange of, of data for primary use within a clinical setting to inform clinical decision making, and how do you repurpose that to meet public health objectives and, and business goals. And so today we're gonna talk uh, really about what's driving um, HIE public health collaboration activity, um, which is th this thing called meaningful use of health information technology. And meaningful use of health information technology is focused on, at, at least in the first stage, uh, th three fairly, I guess what you call staple uh, public health surveillance activities, uh, registration of immunizations, uh, electronic laboratory reporting, and syndromic surveillance, which by comparison is fairly new. Um, and then, of course, in, in stage two, and, and it was already mentioned, uh, we started working on um, how you do structured data reporting to central cancer registries through the Kentucky Health Information Exchange. Um, and then I'll talk to, uh, talk to you a little bit about the, the, the surveillance services that we, are, we have built into the HIE and, and how we're doing on those. So I, I've been doing this for about 12 years now at different levels um, with, with slightly different focus, but it's always been on um, how do you acquire data for uh, achieving public health ends? And what's what really exciting to me, and, and this is another example, is you know over the last 12 years you've seen this growing interest in public health and you know how public health can get, become engaged in health information exchange and the modernization of our health information technology. Because if you're if you know anything about public health, we were technology deprived for about the last 50 years, and and so it's been. Only very recently that we've been able to come to the table or been brought to the table, um, and, and, and many and there are a lot of leaders out there that have really been kicking and screaming to get us to the table, you know, of how we advance with the healthcare uh, community, uh, so that and this is personal opinion, uh, but I I, I, I I very firmly believe that meaning the 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 success of meaningful use will only be gauged through our ability to monitor our populations, um, because. We're not going to really, in my opinion, be able to, to tell if, if the adoption of HIT is really working until we see significant changes in the health of our population, and that's what public health is, is supposed to be doing. So uh, again, you know, this is uh, you know, just a, a Google search of uh, just an example that you know, people are starting to talk about how, how does HIE and public health fit together. Um, and people are also starting to talk about how you use HIE to achieve public health ends. And then finally, um, and you know, of course this is a little old, this is 2005, but you can see here we're actually becoming a priority as it relates to the health information exchange. And we're not the highest priority, but we're at least at the table. And, and to me that is a, a significant change um, since you know, early 2000, 2001. So what, what do we mean by the meaningful use of health information technology in public health? And uh, essentially, and it is a little techy, so um, forgive me, but it's, you know, it, it, it's not too bad. Um, public health and, and the public health activity in HIE has really been being, being driven by these incentive payments and, these, and the requirements to um, receive incentive payments through health information exchange. And so as I mentioned earlier, there, there are three primary functions um, that a, a eligible provider, whether it be a, a private practitioner or a hospital, uh, can do to demonstrate meaningful use of HIT as it relates to public health. The first and the most prominent in our state, and as in many states, is you know, how do you use health information technology, and in, in our case through an exchange, to register a vaccination event. Now, those of you that, that may be a little bit more familiar with this use case and what exists behind it, um, this is a first and fairly simple step by comparison to uh, what, is, what is the real value proposition of, um, of immunization reporting and health information exchange, which at the end of the day would be something like an electronic medical record, i.e. a provider can submit a vaccination as well as a query 
and be able to pull that information back into their EMR so that they have the data at the time of presentation and they don't have to break out of their workflow to go to, let's say, a secondary immunization system or something of that nature. And so as it relates to um, that, that level of query and response through the HIE, it's, we're fairly early on in our ability to do that. And Kentucky has not yet implemented you know, the full transaction set that allows you know, this dynamic interaction between EMRs and, and our central immunization registry. But we started, um, as most, in, as most um, health information exchange started, with how do we at least do the one-way transaction? How do we at least allow a provider to register uh, immunization through our health information exchange? This one gets a little bit more involved, um, but it's essentially the same problem. And just keep that in mind that whether it's immunizations or electronic laboratory reporting or vaccinations or cancer registry, it's essentially the same problem. You, you got uh, tools are a little different and um, some recommendations and the way you use them are a little bit different, but um, there's a, there's a layer of abstraction that essentially ties all these together. Uh, but uh, again, you know, the, uh, a second service that we've been working on and that's being promoted by um, the meaningful use of HIT is syndromic surveillance. Now this is not to be confused with electronic laboratory reporting and communicable disease, which people often get confused about that. Syndromic surveillance exists at the, at the, the uh, front end of the, the development of an event over time. And so you've got you know, individuals that are coming into emergency rooms or critical access centers and they're presenting with something, right? They say, I have a headache, my stomach hurts, what have you. Or, you know, I fell and broke my arm. Um, and this, this, uh, this emphasis on surveillance is really how do you get indicators of something occurring at, at the level of a community prior to your more solid or more or diagnostic indicators like laboratory results. And so <clears throat> syndromic surveillance, particularly within meaningful use, has really been pushed hard. And so you're going to see, um, you know, over time, that states uh, well, working with their public health departments, I believe, are gonna be, you know, really have to start grappling with these, you know, how do you develop and, and, um, and, and uh, manage these robust syndromic surveillance systems because as a whole, and again, I can only speak from Kentucky's perspective, we don't have a lot of experience with syndromic surveillance data. We work with communicable disease data, immunizations, but this is a bit of a new area for public health in general. Um, as, as I've already mentioned, the, 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 the third uh, stage one meaningful use public health surveillance activity, and this is really a staple for us, is electronic laboratory reporting. And so in, in this particular context, we're talking about things like salmonella cultures and shigella cultures and things of that nature that um, infection control practitioners and case managers in, in reportable disease use to begin doing case investigations and then finally report those things like to CDC for instance. And so in the past, public health has largely relied on, on paper and facts um, or direct connections with um, you know, these, these uh, primary data providers to get this data in, in, a, in a timely fashion, um, you know, hopefully with a little bit uh, more completeness than what you would see in the past. But now we're seeing this trending or this shifting towards um, the idea that HIEs are seeing laboratory data anyway. You know, so why not figure out how to use the laboratory data we're seeing to create continuity of care records and, and, um, and populate virtual health records and things of that nature and figure out how to inform public health surveillance and, and get that data to them in a more timely fashion. And then finally, <clears throat> this one, uh, we're, we're very proud of. Um, it does have its limitations. Oh, let's see, oh, 11 minutes, okay. Um, and this one finally is, is the, uh, you know, what we mentioned a little earlier, which is um, the reporting of cancer events from ambulatory centers, um, ambulatory providers, to our central cancer registry. And our, our emphasis here is getting treatment data, because I don't know what you know about uh, Kentucky's central cancer registry, but we have a big treatment data hole. Um, and it's, it's essentially the way our, the way the um, EPATH reporting system was originally imp implemented through, you know, the, the support of NACER. And not, not that it's a bad thing, it's just it's now developing into, um, you know, through this initiative, a way to acquire treatment data so you can do more research on outcomes and, and things of that nature. And so we're, we're working specifically with ambulatory providers that are seeing cancer patients and getting treatment um, and how, you know, how you get the data out of those EMRs to populate um, reports in the central cancer registry. And this is limited primarily by the adoption of standards, which 
as you probably all know, um, the, 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 the public publication of standards and the adoption of, of technology, there's a, there's a lag, or adoption within technology is, is, uh, exists a lag. So having, having kind of gone at a very high level of the services that we're interested in, ultimately, this is our objective um, as it relates to public health. And so as you can see, um, and, uh, the data that, that is coming into the Health Information Exchange is data that we're collecting anyway. Um, we collect what's called ADT data uh, to populate our MPI. Um, so that we can identify individuals within the Health Information Exchange. Well, that also happens to be the kinds of data that syndromic surveillance wants. Um, we collect laboratory results so we can add them to continuity of care records. Um, again, that's the kind of data that public health wants for communicable disease reporting. Immunizations, um, a little bit of a different use case, uh, but, uh, but uh, again, um, our, our providers are, are expressing the desire to come on board with the Health Information Exchange and then we help them figure out how to redistribute that data uh, to, to um, you know, achieve uh, um, legislatively required reporting and, and, and meaningful use objectives. And then finally, um, the cancer reporting. Again, you know, we're kind of serving as an interface engine or an integrator. Let me use that very lightly, um, the term integrator, uh, such that the cancer registry only need work with us, and then we can figure out how to get the data from everyone else. <clears throat> and so ultimately, you know, we're collecting all this data and we use rules and triggers and things of that nature to figure out where we're going to send these data to. And so we're going to be working with the, we're working with the Biosense program for syndromic surveillance. We use what's called the NEDS-based system for our communicable disease reporting. Of course, we have the Central Cancer Registry and then down here is Kentucky's Immunization Registry. So, you know, what, the, the foundation of all of our public health work is essentially entities, organizations, and, and HIT participating in the Health Information Exchange. And so this gives you an idea of the, the uh, amount of growth, uh, the trend upward, thankfully, in the number of participation agreements we have with individual providers as well as organizations um, in the healthcare information exchange. So our, our 400, yeah, 400 signed participation agreements represent about 909 healthcare locations across the state. And this gives you an idea of the, the, the volume that we're beginning to deal with um, in the health information exchange. And this volume is important, particularly these things right here, because this is what we've been keying off of to support public health surveillance and reporting. And so we're, we're keying off of the, the, you know, the volumes of ADT transactions so we can do reporting to the Biosense program. And we're keying off the lab transactions so we can do reporting to the communicable disease program. And so, you know, are the volumes gigantic? No, uh, but they're growing. And that's, I think that's probably the, the most important point of, of that particular slide. <clears throat> and so the basis for our surveillance system, um, uh, and this is specific really to electronic laboratory reporting, are the hospitals and, you know, um, specifically the, the, the laboratory-based hospitals or the hospital-based laboratories, excuse me, um, that we have signed across the state. And although this doesn't show only um, or hospitals with laboratories, you do get a sense of the, the coverage that we have in the Health Information Exchange today um, that serves as our basis for doing electronic laboratory reporting to public health. And, um, uh, and, and, and on a different note, you, know, you can also see the coverage we have and the type of provider that we have for um, immunization reporting to our central immunization registry. And again, you know, it's whether it's immunizations or ELR or what have you, it's pretty much the same problem, but what's the most, the most important problem is getting people to participate, getting the entities to sign up and to work with us to overcome what is a very dirty data environment um, if you've ever worked in the wild of health information exchange. So, um, let me just check here. I don't wanna lose my finger. All right, um, so at a, at, a, at a fairly high level, this is what our HIE looks like, but whoop, what's really important here is this particular component, uh, because this is how we collect all the data. What we do is we essentially have this presence out in the, the IT environment of the connected organization, um, and wh what we call edge servers, and essentially the edge server is a way for us to collect data 
um, in structured form for the most part. And then once we have it in structured form, then given some other preconditions, uh, we can do some things with it to, to provide it to public health. Um, I think I've got enough time here. So this is, a, again, fairly high level um, a way to demonstrate kind of how we work with our providers to achieve our public health surveillance services. Um, and so, you know, our first use case is, is uh, they have an immunization provider that wants to send a VXU to our, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the VXU is the immunization message, it's the data, uh, wants to send immunization data to our immunization registry. And so we, we essentially have two ways that providers can connect to us um, and then uh, uh, subsequently to the, uh, the immunization registry. And it's either through what we just talked about was an edge service device, or they can also do web services calls, but we, we don't see that happen as often in this particular use case. But either way, you know, they connect and we're able to collect the data from them. And then we run through some, some rules. Um, and so, you know, essentially a black box wireless or kind of thing. Um, where we look at the message and we, you know, we look at some particular pieces of information and we determine that it belongs to the immunization registry. And so um, we then open up a secure connection and send that on to the Kentucky Immunization Registry. So that would be the first use case. Um, the second use case is um, electronic laboratory reporting where we have a communicable disease source um, and they're wanting to send um, or we, we'd, we would like to receive some ELR um, that they've generated uh, as a result of our, our, our communicable disease laws in Kentucky. And again, we, you know, we pick up the information um, and it's, it's all the information. It doesn't matter what kind of laboratory result it is. They're providing us every laboratory result that they would generate. And then within the Health Information Exchange, we figure out that it's, it, it belongs to the communicable disease program. And then that, again, gets shipped off to this thing, what we call Hermes here. Uh, which is essentially nothing more than um, a, a secure platform for transmitting the data to our communicable disease program. And then uh, third, you know, as we've already discussed, the syndromic surveillance use case. Um, again, it's the same problem, it's just a different message, it's different data. Uh, but, um, you know, again, the provider gives us all of the ADT data, all the admission discharge transfer data that they're seeing. And then based on some information in that data, we determine that um, it belongs to the Biosense program. And so we you know, make a copy of that message and send it on to Biosense. That way public health can then look at the syndromic surveillance data through the Biosense program and do community level monitoring. And then of course finally, we have um, an ambulatory provider uh, that wants to participate in the, the cancer registry uh, program and so they use, they use essentially this implementation guide for a continuity of care record and, um, or, sorry, central cancer registry reporting um, and uh, use a, a different way to connect than the other services to send that on to the central cancer registry. So um, long story short, uh, you know, we've, we've done a fairly good job at figuring out how you take all of this work for the, for, for, um, health information exchange um, as it relates to providing uh, access to primary data across a distributed network. And we figured out how to, to take that data and repurpose it and provide it to public health to meet secondary, secondary surveillance objectives. And so as we go forward, um, we're now looking at um, implementing some quality monitoring services for our public health surveillance um, such that you know, we, we can look at compliance, for, at, at compliance for standard usage for things like laboratory test orders and results um, and uh, compliance of the interface itself. And so, you know, a lot of fairly elaborate, techie, somewhat boring um, objectives to, you know, be able to learn more about um, how, our, how our data providers are moving along with meaningful use and what those implications are on the actual quality of the feed that we're providing to the Department for Public Health. So with that, um, if you'd like to learn more about meaningful use in public health, um, you can visit the, the Centers for Disease Control's uh, FIN website. Of course, this is the Kentucky Health Information Exchange website, and down there, obscured by the chairs, is my email address if you'd like to contact me directly. And I finished with 20 seconds to spare. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. We have questions for Brennan. We've got time for about two. Okay. Is your, uh, title, uh, is your, are you feeding information to public health as 
Okay, so that's a good question. Um, the 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 w the way the systems are set up, we're pointing to different endpoints, right? And so the immunization registry, for instance, belongs to a contractor that maintains it for the Department for Public Health out in Utah. The NEDS based system sits in the basement of our building. Um, the cancer registry belongs to the University of Kentucky. The Biosense application lives in the cloud with the CDC. And so um, each service requires a unique endpoint you know, based on, on the history and the development of those systems. But the rules that decide that it belongs to a particular system and where it goes all exist centrally. And so public health um, is, is fragmented in that respect, that they use diff disparate systems, and so they still haven't kind of come to grips with how you integrate all the information into something that you would call, um, uh, you know, uh, what are they, what, I, I'm, now I'm drawing a blank on it. But anyway, they haven't figured out how to integrate the data so you can get a more holistic picture of what's going on in a particular community. They're still using silos, um, but silos that are interoperable via these standardized interfaces. So, yeah. Oh yeah. Um, so I mean, for, the endpoint is fairly irrelevant to us, right? I mean, what's relevant to us is, you know, is the structure standard, and is are are, are certain key elements the codes that are used um, homogeneous across you know, the, 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 the data provider so that we can run a single set of rules as opposed to one-off rules for each, for each data provider. And so where we send it, it really it doesn't matter much to us, right? We program fairly quickly. Yes, oh yeah, I mean it's essentially saying, you know, now if you're an ORU, you go to this IP address as opposed to you know, this IP address. Any other questions? Thank you very much. And now I'm pleased to invite uh, Scott Frank to introduce his panel. Uh, Scott Frank is professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics, uh, director of our Master's in Public Health program, and in his spare time, the, uh, the uh, department, the Shaker Heights Health Department uh, commissioner uh, for the, sorry. Commissioner, um, and uh, for a panel on health information and innovations in technology. Uh, it's going to be just a second, and I'll be talking as I'm doing this, but one of our presentations is not yet uploaded. If you all can let go of that screen in the back. All right, um, I should have invited you to take a stand. Uh, it's been a long day, maybe just stand up and stretch a little bit. Uh, I, as I comment, if you'd like, if you don't want to, that's fine. Um, uh, I am very pleased to be here today um, uh, because I am a data lover. Um, uh, I love data, not because I love numbers, I actually don't love numbers at all. But I love the meaning of numbers, and the meaning of those numbers as they relate both to individual patients and to patient populations. So I find this uh, session exciting, inciting, inviting, uniting, igniting, delighting, uh, and uh, which with much less infighting uh, than we used to have uh, around these issues. 
Now, if I had been born in a different decade and in a different culture, that would have been a wrap. But uh, uh, for today, it was just my list of, uh, of items for you. Um, uh, part of the reason I love numbers and data is that I consider them to be the glue that can really bind public health and medicine in a way we haven't been able to accomplish to date. Um, uh, particularly, primary care and public health have a great sharing of values uh, and of goals, uh, but uh, a terrible history of collaboration. Um, so uh, I believe that data will be the thing that uh, uh, binds us together uh, and allows us to, uh, to work uh, more effectively together. And I love data because it represents um, context. Uh, uh, I, in fact, describe myself, and I hope you all consider describing yourselves as contextologists. Um, uh, all, what all of this data does is provide us context about uh, the uh, health of our patients and the care uh, that we uh, provide to populations. Um, so our session will really focus on this uh, uh, sense of context to a great extent. Uh, we have three speakers, um, and uh, our first uh, speaker uh, will be uh, John Barley. Uh, John is the Chief of uh, Health Research and Quality um, for Ohio Medicaid. Uh, and his pr the purpose of that agency is to improve quality, safety, efficiency, and effectiveness of health care for Ohio. Uh, most importantly, the central goal of Dr. Barley's research is measurable improvement in health care gauged through improved quality of life, patient experience and outcomes, lives saved, and value uh, gain for what we spend. What a great description. Um, uh, so uh, without uh, further ado, exciting, huh? Uh, we'll uh, bring uh, Dr. Burley up uh, to share. I've also suggested that our speakers consider presenting from the basic uh, PowerPoint template. It's there. Um, uh, with a little bit uh, smaller version of the screen so that you can actually see the bottom of the slides. So see how that goes. Uh, I've missed seeing the bottom of the slides. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, nice, inter nice introduction, it's good to be here. Um, I'm uh, focusing on a new program at Ohio Medicaid. It's called Health Homes. Not sure if uh, many of you have heard of it or not. It started last October uh, with just a couple of counties, not Cuyahoga County, but uh, we hope to expand soon. So what I'm focusing on in, in this talk is um, looking at how we're using data to improve quality. So through our new project called Health Home. So a few slides about the program itself so you have an understanding of what we're doing. Uh, Health Homes actually was started with the ACA. It's an option Medicaid uh, has all states have that um, are interested in putting their Medicaid recipients in a um, program that's designed to help uh, increase and coordinate their care better. Um, and you can see here, uh, looking at you know, what is a, a health home, it's really uh, focused on complex, um, multi-chronic uh, condition folks who need a lot of help coordinating their care. And, um, I'm not going to read through each bullet there, that is a summary of it, but what I love about it is CMS, who is uh, approving states' plans, really put a strong emphasis on the HIT component. Yes, states, you can do this. They're actually paying 90% of the bill for this for the first two years, but we also want a strong HIT component, and we want uh, uh, measurable outcomes. So that's 
That's great. Actually, this will be the first program in Ohio where um, we're requiring at a clinic, clinician level, um, these performance measures and uh, use of information to improve quality. So it's pretty exciting. Um, in Ohio, uh, one more slide on the general program. It's similar to PCMH approach, but not the same. It's really, like I said before, focusing on the multiple complex, the really needy folks. It's the top one, two percent, uh, maybe three percent that, that are uh, really uh, sick and high risk folks. Um, there is a nice focus also. There's lots of features I like about this program, uh, the ACA set up. It is, uh, the attempt is there to integrate across behavioral and the medical or the physical health and also long-term care for those who need that service too. Um, so it's building a lot of bridges between uh, different provider types and uh, the hope is that electronic information exchange will, will be the, uh, uh, the way that those connections are made and um, o over the years. It's, the expectation isn't too high up front, but there is over time as you'll see. All right, so the goals, uh, these are great goals, improve care coordination. I like to improve health outcomes. Um, my director likes the bottom one, reduce health care costs. Uh, we'll, we'll see about that. If we can get through all the, all the top ones, I'm sure the, the cost will take care of itself. So um, I do want to tie this back to our, uh, in Medicaid, the Office of Health Transformation. Uh, directs all the health departments. Greg Moody is the director of there, probably many of you know. Um, he has had a focus since day one in the Kasich administration of integrating behavior and he behavioral health and physical health and improving care coordination. So this, when this fell out of the ACA, it just lined up perfectly with Greg Moody's goals. Uh, he decided you can pick between a long list of chronic conditions, both physical and mental health conditions. He decided to focus on the SPMI, or the severe persistent mental illness population first. Um, he thought that was a good place to start and then um, move on into um, other conditions. Like I said, we're in five counties now. Phase two, October 2013 is coming up. We will go statewide. So our providers for the SPMI population is uh, community mental health agencies. And we've provided a framework we want them to arrange within their clinic of how to deliver uh, health home services, which are the following. And it lines up with the goals and lines up uh, with what I've said before. These are six specific services, um, seven specific services uh, that are outlined in the ACA, actually. So, and I highlighted the one at the bottom, which is what I want to focus on today, uh, and the quality improvement component of the program. All right, so uh, we're requiring, so these are community mental health agencies have to apply to the state to become a health home for the SPMI population, right? So we re have a lot of requirements, and a lot of them are uh, just forwarded down from the federal, federal program as they outlined it. So they all must have a quality improvement program. You must have a designated staff person responsible for oversight of that program. They must uh, monitor and report health home performance on our performance measures. And I'm not gonna go over each one of these, but what I like about this list, CMS came up with their list and we added on to it, is it's shifting towards the outcome view versus whether a screen of someone who has a chronic condition was conducted to what level is it? So we're, we're shifting to true outcomes, in my point of view, by let's see if your uh, diabetes is controlled versus are you just getting the right screening. So it's starting to shift in that direction. That's what I like about our list here. All right, so today's health homes, real quick, I want to touch on that. We have six of them in, in those counties and enrollment about 14,000. And again, it started October 2012. So. Um, and in, in 12 months, October 2013 is when we'll go uh, statewide. So what are our expectations around health IT and tied to quality? Um, well, we expect them all to 
uh, use EHRs within one year of participation. All right. Um, community mental health agencies, there's just a huge range of their technology capability. There's some that are more affiliated with hospital centers that are way up there, have used electronic medical records for some time, and then there's some still using paper, and they're just considering EHRs. So we have to deal with the base of providers in uh, such a wide situation. We've decided that uh, if you're going to be a health home provider, you have to use EHRs within one year of participation. You have to actually acquire it if, you, if you're not using it all, at all. And then in two years, you start using it meaningfully. And but what we mean by that, it's aligned with the meaningful use objectives, is um, electronic prescribing, uh, population management, using registries and, and different reminders, and using your EHR, your electronic health or medical record information to um, identify areas of deficiencies on outcome and performance measures. And then we want them to tie that into their quality improvement activities, that requirement that we had, you know, a couple slides above this one. So, and then of course connect to the local HIE when available. Um, right now, five of the six health homes have EHR. None is connected, right? None are affiliated with any local system that would have it, like a hospital system perhaps, or uh, in other areas of the state. So um, their job over the next few years, just connecting and then start actually using that information that they have access to in their quality improvement pro programs, um, it's gonna be uh, upcoming over the next couple years, which is pretty exciting. Um, so how is the state supporting our health homes? to get access to the information they need. Really, right now, they're isolated. Is that my uh, timer? My time's up? <laughs> <laughs> I only have a few more slides. Um, so how are we supporting them? Right now, the health homes, mental a a health agencies, uh, just have their view of, the, of their folks. They are partnering with the primary care physician, so they'll have another, the primary care view once they partner with that and start the integration of behavioral and physical health. So they, they, that's a huge shift for them. Some of them already have primary care on site. Some of them don't and they have to partner with one if they want to be a health home. But at least they'll have that information. But there's still a lot of health information they don't have access to. Inpatient admits, ED visits, what have you, that would really help in the care coordination. So besides our um, MPIP program, uh, which is primarily for primary care, so it would only apply to community mental health agencies if they have on-site primary care, which some do. Um, we are providing dollars through the federal program, uh, and you can see how much we've um, given out in Ohio so far. But it's really data, and you mentioned it uh, first. You need data to improve, right? And it, and it has to be timely. The best we can do right now since they're not uh, tied in, our health homes are not tied in electronically and receiving electronic data from any other source, is to give them at least a uh, claims history. And that's what the state is doing for all their enrollees. The first uh, month of enrollment, we give them a year's claims history of that person. And then monthly ongoing, we give them the monthly update as far as our claims view. Realize it has the claims lag in it, right, a couple months there, it's not perfect, would be real-time information, when they went to the ED, when they got admitted or discharged from a hospital, but it's a lot better than what they have now, which is nothing, right? So they also, a lot of our folks are enrolled in managed care plans, and they have relationships uh, formed with them, and soon we'll be pro providing each health home with quarterly results of those whole list of performance measures um, so they can gauge how they're doing on those measures um, in a quarterly fashion and feed that into their quality improvement program. Um, and that's, we're also sponsoring learning communities where the health homes, the quality staff get together and face-to-face, -face, um, it's truly a community focusing on things like integration, care management, and of course, the results of the performance measures themselves. So, and really, the learning community is 
communities is really about how to gather the data from the various sources and feed it into a QI project that helps improve the results, which is very challenging and it's uh, pretty new for a lot of community mental health agencies. So here's our challenges. They've got a lot going on all at once. They're integrating behavioral and physical health. Their focus is on coordinating across multiple provider sites. They have to interface. Uh, many of their clients have multiple, multiple needs. They have to interface with a lot of different agencies. Of course, information exchange and performance measurement is relatively new for them. Uh, but they're learning and transforming, which is really good. So we'll have like a first year's uh, result out. Um, it'll probably be about a year from now to, uh, on the first wave of folks. So that's our health homes. We'll do uh, questions as a panel at the end. Our next uh, speaker is uh, Jason Gilder. Jason is uh, filling in for uh, Anil Jain, uh, who um, uh, couldn't be here today after all. Um, and uh, uh, he uh, works with Dr. Jain uh, integrally and um, uh, will be uh, presenting. He is the Director of Informatics and Analytics at Explorus, a tremendously exciting development uh, for those of us who love data. Um, uh, and uh, Dr. Gilder manages standardization, normalization, uh, quality of data uh, for the Explorers big data platform. He leads Explorers, uh, the Explorers team in the development of uh, content for its cloud-based platform. I think that cloud-based platform is uh, probably a result of global warming. Uh, and uh, we'll look forward to hearing uh, more about Explorers. Thank you very much. Just let me see if I can get that. Wow. Um, so I, I was brought in to discuss a little bit about what Explorus is and how we work and really how we are helping to drive healthcare innovation. That's really what this whole area is talking about. How can we use data to drive new developments and new understanding of data and ultimately drive improvements in uh, the cost and quality of healthcare. So I will give you a brief overview of our system and, and how we're set up. It's a little bit different from some of the other systems probably that have been presented here today and really a lot different than a lot of the other systems that are out there in general. So first about Explorers, we, were, uh, we are a spin-off company of the Cleveland Clinic. We were formed at the end of 2009. And what we are, it's a cloud-based computing platform for the storage and analysis of patient data. So we partner with different healthcare systems, multiple, uh, usually large IDNs, integrated delivery networks, and we bring in all their clinical, financial, and operational data into our secure private cloud. We standardize and normalize that data, and then we develop applications that sit on top of that platform to allow for analytics, looking at the data, search, anything that you really need to do. So the whole goal of the company, the mission, is to unlock the power of big data to improve health care for everyone. So what about our network? Our, our network's made up of 14 IDNs currently. Uh, you can see that we have several in the Ohio region. We have the Cleveland Clinic, University Hospitals, Akron General, Summa Health, Metro Health, and then also Catholic Health Partners. And so we have a pretty nice footprint there, but we also have a nice footprint in the country as a whole. We have from the East Coast with MedStar to the West Coast with St. Joe's and even into Hawaii with Queens. And so right now we're, we're sitting at around 200 hospitals uh, with over 100,000 providers. And that means we have about 20, well, currently about 24 million patient lives going back, uh, sometimes more than 10 years worth of data for these systems. And I would say by the end of this year, we will easily be at 35 million patient lives. So it's growing at a very rapid pace, and it's, it's really substantial, and it, it really is a comprehensive view of care for patients. And when we talk about unlocking the power of that data, it's not just that you have the ability to now marry all of the data sources within your healthcare system. So I mean, that alone is really powerful to be able to say, here's all of my clinical data from any of my clinical systems all in one place 
along with all the financial and operational data in one place, but we also allow the ability to search that data in a safe, de-identified form across our entire network. So if you have research needs where you're only able to look at your own population, you may have a, a decent sized healthcare system, but it really is no match for looking across millions and millions of patients in a safe manner. So it's, it's pretty exciting. And a lot of our partners have gotten some really great value out of that. Here's the platform, and this is really one of the major areas where we differentiate ourselves. And when you talk about innovation, it's really one of the central questions is what platform are you innovating with? If you're using traditional architectures, you may be limited into what you can do. In fact, the very definition of big data is where data sets become too awkward because they're too large to analyze using traditional technologies. So that's where we step in and we have a cloud-based platform. It's built on Hadoop and HBase. So it's an open source standard. It's the same basic framework that's used by Google, Facebook, Yahoo, Amazon, and others. And it's very versatile and it's expandable. And so if we ever need more horsepower, it's actually very, very fast, but if we ever need more horsepower or more storage or, or anything like that, we simply add more service. So it's very, very cool. We have our data acquisition step at the very beginning. We have more than 250 different connectors where we connect to different healthcare systems. Uh, meaning within one IDN, we'll connect to all the, as I said earlier, the clinical, financial, and operational data systems, so all the EMRs, the billing systems, if you have a surgical system, laboratory system, claims, feeds, anything like that, we can bring that in, standardize and normalize that in our cloud. And then we have engines that sit on top of that. So we have everything from the data curation step that I mentioned in terms of scrubbing the data, standardizing and normalizing it, to things like data governance, who can see that data and when can they see that data, to patient attribution. If you're talking about accountable care, it's all about identifying who is the responsible party for that patient. And so we have a very flexible engine for identifying who ultimately is that responsible provider or party that should be looking at that. Calculation engines for performing analytics, doing performance measurement, um, and, and several other areas as well. And then we have our prescriptive solutions that sit on top of that. This is all about the applications that we have to allow you to get insight into the data and ultimately identify what steps need to be taken to improve the quality of care and lower costs. So we have Explore as the first tool. It's a, like a Google for providers and medical researchers. You can define patient populations like you would perform a Google search. You can enter any criteria from a patient's past, their past history, identify those populations, and then perform some analytics on them or download the data set and, and perform analytics outside of the application for your own data. We also have a tool called Measure, which is all about quality-based reporting metrics. And what that does is we leverage a lot of the national standards as well as developing our own quality metrics to do things like measure how patients are doing, how they're being treated, what are their outcomes, what are their costs, and ultimately give visibility into what's actually happening in a healthcare system and, and help to drive that change. We have registry, which is like the name implies, it's a patient registry. It's a, a way of viewing patient populations, tracking them over time, looking at the important clinical data elements or other data elements and events in their history, and then tracking that and, and identifying and, and providing uh, care coordination. And then finally, we have Engage, which is all about closing the loop in, with care coordination, identifying those patients that need additional care, reaching out, sending them a letter, logging a phone call, putting them in a work queue, and, and really working on driving that, those numbers to be improved. The way we work is we install what's known as a health data gateway. It's a server that sits within the firewall of the healthcare system. It is connected directly to all the clinical, financial, and operational systems. So we have a direct tie into all those systems. So as soon as they're updated, as soon as that data comes in, we can pull it directly into our cloud. So sometimes you might have a reporting database, like an Epic Clarity instance. So that's usually updated once a day. We'll get it once a day. If you have something more real time, like HL7, we'll get it real time. And again, that's just brought right into our cloud. Uh, we, big data is all about volume, velocity, and variety. We have over 107 billion curated clinical data elements in our system. And when we talk about that curation process, it's really trying to get to the, the meaning of the data, getting um, semantic interoperability. Because you're dealing with so many different data sources, it's important to make sure that you're able to standardize them in some way.
Now we keep the originating records as they are all the time, but we also do some standardization steps to allow them to be searched and accessed a little more easily. So for example, a procedure might be coded with CPT typically or HCPCS code, but oftentimes it's a custom code. And so in that case, we'll, we, well, in actually all cases, we'll standardize that to SNOMED. And then at the end of the day, it doesn't matter where that data came from. You can search and access all of the data from all of the different systems as if they came from a single source. And when we talk about um, what we do, we can't do everything ourselves. So we have to know uh, when we can use some of the standards and other expertise that's out there. We can't do it alone. So we've leverage a lot of the, the really cool technologies that are available today, CTAKES for natural language processing, IMO for ontology management, I already mentioned we're using SNOMED for diagnoses, procedures, pharma classes, LOINC for laboratory tests and observations, NLM, their slew of tools and ontologies, as well as then looking at content and best practices. We've developed many quality metrics in our platform, more than 700, but we can't develop them all ourselves, or it wouldn't make sense for us just to develop them all ourselves. Why reinvent the wheel when there are national standards available? So that's why we leverage groups like NCQA, NQF, CMS, and, and others to actually get those meaningful metrics that you can then report on and track. And then finally, where is innovation if not in academics and research? And we recognize that, and that's why we actively partner with groups in the area and, and elsewhere to drive that. So we're working very closely with the CTSC and uh, CASE on some grants. We have one that's funded right now. We have a call for proposals for another couple coming right up here. And we're working with our other partners as well. So for example, MedStar is using our system for several grants and publications, as well as the Cleveland Clinic and others. Um, and when we talk about the, the transformation gap, this is something I'm sure that's been brought up several times today, where we're moving from a fee-for-service system to a pay-for-performance model. It's really all driven by research. We have to understand what drives improved quality of care and what lowers costs, and that's really what we're trying to do. We're all working together to get there. And when we talk about the different knowledge, what we, how we can use knowledge to, to drive uh, actual change in a healthcare system. Unfortunately, this is a slide, so I don't get to show you the little animations, but what I was going to show you here is when you first start out with the data as it comes in, you're just talking about the descriptive analytics. You're talking about what actually happened in the past. And that's really where we are as, uh, for the most part, for a, a lot of different technologies. It's really just about collecting the data get the data in, collect the data, then we can start analyzing it and find out what happened in the past. But what we're really about is not just about collecting data, it's really about driving the information from that data. Simply getting the data does not mean that you have all the information that you need to drive change. That's why we have people, boots on the ground, we have people actively involved with our healthcare partners, we have a clinical implementation consulting team that works actively with our healthcare partners to understand the data flows, the workflows in their system, make sure that they're all brought in and represented properly in our system so that we can accurately represent what's happening in that healthcare system. And then once we have that data and we start analyzing it, we're able to start forecasting and predicting what's going to happen for those patients in the future. What's happening to them now and what might happen to them in the future. And naturally you want to optimize those outcomes so that we are able to take it take into account everything that's happened and then drive the, the good outcomes and then lower costs and, and avoid the, the horrible outcomes that can happen. This is Gartner's analytic ascendancy model. Uh, it's pretty common, you may have seen it before. It's all about looking through these same basic steps from descriptive analytics, what happened to diagnostic analytics, why did it happen, to predictive analytics, what will happen in the future, and finally, prescriptive analytics and of how can we make it happen. And the analogy that we often give is driving a car. If you look in your rear view mirror while you're driving, you're looking at the descriptive analytics. You know what happened in the past. If you look at your dashboard, at your gauges, you're seeing the diagnostic analytics of what's happening right now. If you look at your GPS, you're looking to the future, the prediction, what's going to happen in the future, when will I get there? And then if you have a, a passenger who says, 
that's going to take us way too long. We need to stop and, and get a bite to eat right now. That's the prescriptive analytics, actually seeing where we're headed and making some decisions on, on how we can get the best possible outcome. Um, we're working very actively in predictive analytics. This is a paper that was recently um, published in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology. It's actually a presentation, poster presentation at a meeting there. The abstract was recently published in the journal. And what we did was we partnered with the Cleveland Clinic on payment reform models. In particular, we were looking at bundled payments. Can we predict what the entire cost for an episode will be for a PCI? This was a pilot project, and we took all the information that a patient presented with before they had that operation, and then we were going to put them in three buckets, a high, medium, or low cost bucket, and then you are then better informed as to what the risks associated with those patients are and, and how we can understand the, the real total cost of care for that episode. And so this was a, a successful pilot and we're continuing this type of work with our partners. Um, this is a just a little breakdown of that project. We have our class distributions, our high, medium, and low cost buckets for those patients. And then this is an example of a decision tree, one of about 10,000 that were used. We used a random forest model. And so we generate many, many decision trees using all the, the data elements that were deemed to be valuable or meaningful to, to predict these outcomes and then use that information for that. Um, if we're looking at outcomes in our platform, we really want to look at what some of our partners are doing in this space. And this was just some of the, the feedback that we've gotten. Um, Trinity, for example, Kyle Johnson, vice president there, just talked about how we could grow and adapt and innovate. It's about time, is that my exit cue music? All right. All right. Well, the slides are available in the, I think, in the materials. You guys can take a look at them. There's some publications, things like that, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have when we have the, the round table in a little bit. Our uh, final speaker uh, in this panel, uh, I don't know whether he likes me mentioning this, but I've known him since he was a medical student. Uh, he is the chief informatics uh, uh, officer at, um, in, in the Metro Health Medical System, uh, and uh, he personifies the solutions to the healthcare problems in the U.S. as a med peds physician, uh, a public health trained physician, uh, and uh, a very active uh, researcher in primary care. Um, those are the things we need most. Those are the things that he does best. Um, and uh, yes is the answer to the question, did he even wear bow ties when he was a medical student? Great, thank you very much. Well, hopefully, <clears throat> um, I just wanted to end, I presumably, I guess I'm sort of one of the last um, speakers before some of the wrap up. Hopefully what you're gonna be talking about is what I've seen personally is the value of health information exchange for public health, and really talking about three projects that um, you know, we're already doing at Metro that I think is really, most of them hopefully will agree by the end are sort of the cutting edge with what the potential is for health information exchange in public health. So give a quick introduction, um, and then just the highlight of the three cases. There won't be much time to go through these cases in detail, but happy to take more questions during the round table or at the, the reception afterwards. But ba basically, in my mind, public health sort of occurs at three levels, the federal level, the state level, and then local, whether it's county or city or, or some, some designation like that. So we have an example of each one of those. The first one will be a vaccine adverse uh, event reporting with the CDC that we're doing with Metro. The second one will be mandatory reportable disease uh, reporting that we do between Metro Health and the Ohio Department of Health. And the third um, 
will be something that we're working on. The first two are already in, in progress, so I'll actually present data on how effective they are. The third one is something we're actively doing with a grant from Explorus, actually. We're gonna be looking at Metro Health, Cleveland Clinic, and University Hospitals data to, to think about health information exchange for public health around obesity in Northern Ohio slash Cuyahoga County. So I think that the silo analogy was already brought up um, once before. So I actually have some pictures. I found some pictures of some silos. So right, I think you know traditionally, and again, it's sort of this theme has been presented before. You know, there's sort of clinical electronic health record stuff going on over here. People working here, public health data. People working over here. And although we sort of share the same vision, we're really working pretty much in in isolation historically. Although you know we can always point to examples where we've been bridging some of that. I think, as was already mentioned, data should be the glue that brings us closer together um, so that we end up being sort of at least in the, the same silo together and, and hopefully eventually aren't even in a silo at all. Um, and so and I think the opportunity is, you know, the, the richness of data is sort of growing, as you've heard from um, Dean Davis and others, is growing by leaps and bounds on the clinical side. And so the real opportunity here is how can we take that rich clinical data and start to leverage that for sort of secondary uses um, on, the, on the public health side. Um, and I would just say it really has to do with both the technology solutions to make that happen, as well as the non-technology issues, some of the legal, compliance, regulatory issues, all those working in concert. I think the opportunities, again, I haven't heard these really clearly articulated before, but I think the opportunities for, for HIE and public health fall into several categories. A much more consistency of reporting, at least I know in the world that I'm thinking about, um, you know, for, for adverse disease, adverse um, vaccine reporting, and even sometimes um, reportable diseases. You know, as a provider myself, until I got into this research, I personally didn't realize I have a legal obligation to report. Um, you know, that's a big challenge. And then even if I knew I had a legal obligation to report, you know, if you don't have electronic health information exchange, just the process of reporting can be very complicated. You know, it's some paper form that you got to find somewhere. It's some website that you go to. You don't know all the information to enter. So those end up being very large barriers practically to some reporting. Um, timeliness of reporting for the reasons that I just mentioned and for other reasons can be, um, you know, we heard the example claims data takes months to get in. Um, you know, reporting, if it's not automated, can take days, weeks, months, and depending on the public health issue you're trying to study, those days, weeks, months delays could be very, very important. Um, completeness of reporting, um, you know, a lot of times a provider might not have all the information, although all the information might reside in the clinical information system. And to be actionable on the public health side, you want all the information, not just the snippet of information that the physician may have or the lab may have. And then sort of the quality and accuracy of reporting, which has some overlap with, with some of the others. And again, not only the technology, but the right policy and, and legal framework to think about this. Um, so I, I use the example here. You know, actually, a lot of places are already using health information exchange, although the vehicle for the health information exchange is people. Right? So in a lot of cases right now, the information comes into a clinical setting, a lot of times in the EHR. People, some people know that they have to report, but how do they do that? They're writing all the information down. They're mailing it. They're faxing it. They're calling. So we are getting into other, usually electronic systems here, but it's through people interfaces. So we're doing manual health information exchange. And I think the new paradigm that we're really starting to realize, and I'll get to the example starting in the next slide, um, is an electronic health information exchange, where we know we're already starting from one electronic health record database. So let's have a real time, complete, never forgetting, always knowing that they need to report, you know, electronic health information exchange, getting that information into public health databases for public health purposes. So I think that's the vision of what we're trying to achieve here. So the first case is a vaccine adverse events. And again, this is between Metro Health and uh, the federal government, in this case, the CDC. Um, so this is using an open source platform called ESP. The, the website's down there. People want to look at it. It's been published in a number of um, uh, peer review uh, publications. So ESP, not like we're, we're telepathically going to transmit the information, health information exchange, but ESP standing for Electronic Support for Public Health. So this is a really what I would call a brain or an open source engine that extracts data from electronic health record systems 
processes it, and then sends it to, in this case, the CDC. So let's look a little bit deeper at what that looks like. So we have electronic health record at Metro that's EPIC, and in that we have rich clinical data. We know about vaccines that are given, diagnoses that occur, lab results that are ordered, and the results of those, medications, allergies, all the rich clinical data that's involved in clinical care. And so what we do now is once a night or, or once a day, um, that, that, e that data is extracted to our ESP server that has rich decision support rules that says, hey, you know, this person got an immunization a couple days ago and now presented with a new onset seizure or now has abdominal pain or now has a rash. This could be an adverse vaccine event. Then it sends a message back to a provider that was involved in the care because we know that our rules are not 100%. So we present back to the clinician showing them all the data saying, hey, we know this patient got an immunization in the Metro Health system on this date. And then we also know that these other things happened in the window that may be consistent with an adverse vaccine report. We want your clinical brain to help us figure out if the dots that we seem to connect automatically really are dots that should be connected. And if the answer is yes, a one click to submit all of that data um, to the CDC. So it really overcomes some of these barriers of, you know, a lot of times if I give a vaccine, they're not having an adverse reaction in my office. They might not see me when they have the adverse reaction. They might see someone else. So the system is starting to put those pieces um, together for us and making it very easy uh, to report, and then reporting in real time using an HL7 um, electronic database with VAERS, which is the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System with the CDC. Um, again, for the sake of time, I'm not going into a ton of details, but you know what this breaks down into is we have a possible adverse event um, detected, sent to the clinicians in basket, and we really have several categories. One category, we feel so sure that this is an adverse reaction that even if the clinician does not respond, we will automatically send to the CDC within a certain period of time. Um, other categories are you know, message goes to the clinician and then we really allow them to make the determination if it should be sent or not. Um, if they respond, they can either not respond, either yes or no, which that can be a problem. They either respond, yes, we think it's an adverse reaction and it gets sent or they respond, no, we don't think it's an adverse reaction for whatever reason, and then we actually use that in sort of an intelligent learning way to try to make our algorithms better. Um, so what we've seen in the first four months, this went live right at the end of 2012, so what we've seen in the first basically four or five months here is, is that we gave over 40,000 vaccines at Metro Health during that time, so we give a lot of vaccines at Metro. Um, and of those, uh, just over 700 generate a potential vaccine adverse event from the ESP system. Five of those we thought we had enough confidence in that we sent automatically. So an example of this would be, you know, if a clinician put as a diagnostic code adverse vaccine event, which is an ICD-9 code, those are ones that we would automatically send. But in the old paradigm, the provider might not know that they need to send it to the CDC or how to send it. Um, then of the ones, and I'm sorry, this is animated, so it sort of got cut off a little bit here, but then of the ones that the providers look at, another nine the clinicians thought um, were appropriate and should be sent, and 107 of these, they thought there was a false positive alerting. So we definitely see some opportunities to improve our algorithms here, but the key here is in the middle. So in the three and a quarter years before we turned this on, the Metro Health System had only submitted 15 VAERS reports, so an average of 0.4 per month. Since we've turned this on in the first five months, 14 reports have been sent, so or 2.8 per month, so a seven-fold increase in reporting. This is what we're expecting, right? Some, some applause for all of our physicians, right? So this is what we are expecting, right? Because it's well documented, although nobody knows what the gold standard is, it's well documented that vaccine adverse events are significantly underreported. I think we're still not reporting enough of them because we have a whole bunch of messages. Right? What's underneath here is if you add up nine and 107, it's still a lot less than the 739. So a lot of these messages are not being um, looked at by providers. This is sort of typical of clinical decision support in electronic health record systems. So probably even the seven-fold increase is still underreporting, but it's a huge step. Um, and we, we're the first system in the country to be using this system to report um, adverse events in near real time. 
So case two, mandatory reportable diseases here, we're working again with Metro Health, now reporting data to the state of Ohio for those diseases that are mandated for public reporting. So sexually transmitted disease, some of the hepatitis, pertussis, those types of things. Um, so again, this looks like the same. It's still using our ESP engine. Here we don't have a messaging going back to the provider because here we have high confidence in the algorithms. You know, it's sort of much easier to tell if a, if a diagnosis occurred than an adverse event. Um, so same thing, every night using the richness of the electronic health record data to determine if a reportable disease occurred. And then every morning at about 6 a.m. that all gets sent um, to, the Ohio, to the Ohio Department of Health. As you can see, this is not a picture of Ohio. This is actually a picture of Massachusetts. And so we're the second site in the country to be doing this. It was actually piloted um, in Boston um, with the, uh, the Massachusetts Department of Health with um, uh, Atrius Healthcare in the Boston area. And what have we seen with this? So here we've seen, first of all, during our validation, we wanted to make sure that the algorithms were good, as good or if not better than people doing the algorithms. And so we looked specifically at gonorrhea and chlamydia, which are the two most commonly um, reported mandatory reportable disease in Ohio, and saw that we got good total cases, zero false positives, 100% positive predictive value. So you know our algorithms looked good. And now what about the reporting? So what we did is we compared our manual reporting process to what happened with ESP. So you know gonor and gonorrhea and chlamydia, we had significant uptake. And why is this? This was probably because you know our lab is really good, but maybe they lost the paper. You know something happened to it in the mail. Somebody retyped in something wrong. Somebody didn't fill out the paperwork. So that's probably the you know this the seven twelve percent changes. It's. It's been estimated by other people, if you do data entry, single person data entry, probably about a 7% error. If you do double person data entry, you know, someone checking the manual data entry of someone else, you can probably get down to three to 5% error rate. So just to give you a sense of that. Um, but now for things that occur more rarely, where our engine is making sure not to miss things, we have 43% improvement in reporting, 500% improvement in reporting, with pertussis, 600% improvement in reporting. Um, so this is just the completeness of reporting, never mind the more timeliness, the completeness, all those things. And the other thing I'll, I'll drill down to in the next slide is with pertussis and with all these, because we have the richness of the electronic health record data, we don't need to rely on a confirmatory test. So we can look at suspected cases of reportable diseases as well. And depending on the disease and the clinical and public health purposes that you're trying to account for, knowing that there's, um, knowing what the prevalence of suspected cases is can be just as important in knowing the confirmed cases. Um, and I won't, again, I won't go into a lot of this, but this gets to the idea of electronic lab reporting with electronic disease reporting. Um, and I'll just say, if you just do electronic lab reporting, we only would have gotten 13 confirmed cases. But with electronic disease reporting, where we encompass lab orders, antibiotics, ICD-9 codes, we basically five times fold increased the reporting that we did. Um, and I think for the sake of time, I won't go into a lot of uh, details here, but already showing that we're saving thousands of dollars, even tens of thousands of dollars for Metro Health and for the state, extrapolated to the national level is $7 million. Um, and this last case, I think there's just two slides on. This is obesity monitoring using Explorus. And so what we're leveraging here is the idea that within Cuyahoga County, where you take Metro Health, Cleveland Clinic, and University Hospitals people's data, we feel that the majority of people are represented in those three healthcare systems that are then all Explorus members. So the idea is, is that using Explorus for sort of real-time public health monitoring a population level. And to give you some sense of this, so this is an Explorer screen. Now this is just Metro, but literally in about three minutes, I did this query and showed that in Metro data, we have over 124,000 people in the Northeast Ohio area that are all obese, have a weight problem, kids and adults. And we can follow all this literally in, in real time now, both a static population and dynamic population. And with our grant, through Explorus that we hope that by the end of the third quarter of this year that we'll not only be able to, to be querying just the Metro Health data, but then a combined through what we're calling the KCTSC button, 
at least that's the, the preliminary sort of term of it, we'd be combining University Hospitals, Cleveland Clinic, and Metro data. And so not only could this be used for obesity, but think of all the other public health issues we want to look at when we have a majority of the people in this area all in one system that's queryable in real time quickly with the richness of electronic health record data. So just finishing, I think now is the time for HIE in public health. Should we have increased volume, timeliness, efficiency, quality, and accuracy? And we need to think about the technology issues as well as the, the legal and other non-technology issues. But hopefully the examples I've shown is that this is happening today in Northeast Ohio and I think will be happening more in the country in the future. Thank you very much. Um, three stimulating uh, presentations. Uh, we do have time for um, some questions. Yes. This question is for David. Um, I actually have two. The first is, of the 65 suspected pertussis cases, how many did you end up confirming for, for uh, case reporting to CDC? Um, so this Okay. So these would be ones that did not end up being confirmed. I think, again, what I would say is a, as a MedPeds physician, you know, a lot of times pertussis is not a, you know, we just go with the suspected diagnosis. So if we know that, for instance, there's a known exposure, you know, sort of why take the time, and I don't know if maybe public health people will disagree with this clinical approach, but, you know, if you know there's a known exposure, things like that, we would just go ahead and treat this person symptomatic. They're exposed to somebody else who was a confirmed case. Let's just go ahead and treat them. So of those particular cases, those weren't, didn't end up being confirmed. And then uh, a follow-up is with respect to the project. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know I was right in front of the camera. Um, the, uh, the, now, if, if I understood the setup correctly, the, it was a, a single EMR, an epic EMR that essentially fed a rules engine and then as a result would, would send on um, a report to a, a particular endpoint. Um, are there plans to, to, to try and build in a, a support for additional electronic medical records? I mean, how, is this going to be uh, expanded to a, a statewide HIE level practice? Because I think in that sense it's very exciting. Right. Well, the, again, there's sort of a, a lot of different answers to that. You know, the one answer is it's, it's open source. So literally anybody anywhere can, you know, plug this into their system. You know, right now it's sort of been, in a sense, optimized for use with, with EPIC and then both the Ohio Department of Health. So again, any EPIC customer in Ohio, which there are a lot of them, could be using this. I think if you had a non-EPIC system, it basically just relies on a data extract from your, from your EHR. So as long as you can do a data extract, the rules should all work the same. And I think that's the other exciting thing is that, you know, the rules are very generic and not based on anything in a particular EHR. So I think, I guess, my, my sort of push to this audience, I think it's very extensible in the state of Ohio because we've done the specific feeds to the Ohio Department of Health, which is what presumably all of us in Ohio would need. If we're moving to another state, then you'd have to get connect the feeds to the, the other state's registry. Great. Good question. We could run a quick search for you in about two seconds, but um, several million. I, I think we're at, I'd say probably around five to six million. And uh, at, at Cincinnati, Columbus area, how hard is it going to get there? Uh, Cincinnati is uh, really the home of Catholic Health Partners. So we're, they have 27 hospitals across Ohio a lot in the Cincinnati area, and so we're, we're working very closely with them, and, and so we have a lot of their data captured. Not, not so much in Columbus this second, but that's going to be coming on board very soon with Trinity. So as we bring their data in, they'll be represented. Sharon? Are you able to link that yet? 
Right, absolutely. So I, I neglected to mention this, but we do full patient matching. So within healthcare systems, a, even if you have one EMR, you still need to do patient matching between the clinical systems and the billing systems. So there's patient matching there, and then between healthcare systems. So if I happen to go to the Cleveland Clinic one day, and then Metro the next day, and then university hospitals after that, I am in the system once. I have one patient record with all of that data associated with it. So I would just say for this, what we're doing with the obesity, that's key, right? Because if we just combined everybody that without deduping, you know, Cleveland Clinic, Metro Health, and UH, there's a ton of duplication that occurs between these three healthcare systems. So that's really one of the powers of Explorers for this project is that it will do deduping as sort of a natural byproduct of the Explorers tool. We have one last question from David. That's a really good question. We, we have not had those uh, discussions yet. I'm not sure exactly how that's going to work out, but I know at least moving forward, those patients will naturally be part of the system. All right, I'd like to thank our panel for a great presentation. <laughs>
sharing partnerships will have to emerge um, to respond to the growing needs. What we heard today from Dan and Craig about the OHIP and health bridge, that's a start. Um, and that I believe came from the director's office, uh, from Director Moody. Uh, the other thing which we will have to look at is data governance and, and its associated policies and contracting structures because they would carry a significance in this new world of healthcare reform where we are looking at improved patient outcomes, better cost efficiencies, and accountability. As we look at top meaningful initiatives across US, one of the things which everyone is trying to do is implement capability to electronically exchange key clinical information between providers and publicly authorized entities. At the end of the day, when, when I look at the discussions which have happened throughout the day, it's all about data. And when we look about data, it's about the fundamental capability of information readiness. Data by itself can do much. It's information readiness and analytics, whether we are looking behind or we are looking at predictive analytics. Those are the key aspects we'll have to look at as we move forward. In terms of policies, which we have been working on with the governor's office, one thing we have realized last year, and, and Dan talked about one state policy which, which was about the, the state privacy law and consent management. How did that come about? When we were looking last year, there were, what we realized is barriers to innovations are prevalent in the health and human services agencies. The policies, spending, and administration for Medicaid itself was split across five agencies. And when we look across all the health and human services program, that was split across more than 14 agencies. So what the governor did as part of the 2012 mid biennium review was give an opportunity to the health and human services agencies to identify better ways to deliver services and, and eliminate those barriers. And one of the things we looked at is the state privacy law in some cases was not consistent with the federal law in terms of data sharing. And what that did was impede the, the health information exchange. As part of the House Bill 487, which be became law in 2012, we did harmonize the state policies or the state standards with federal HIPAA privacy rule when it comes to protected health information, usage, and disclosure. And that, we thought, would speed up the adoption of HIEs in Ohio. The other aspect I think Rex talked about in August is the enhancing statewide data sharing through agencies without wall. Just to share data between programs prior to that, it had to be a cumbersome legal procedure which would take months and years. As part of that House Bill 487, that it authorized the sharing of data, personnel, funding, and operating resources amongst those agencies to, for health transformation purposes in accordance with the federal law. This, we thought, would facilitate the seamless and efficient implementation of health transformation activities. There are three areas of focus uh, which I want to talk about. One thing is modernizing Medicaid. As you are aware, Medicaid is the largest health care payer or health payer in Ohio, spending $20 billion in 2013, providing coverage to 2.3 million Ohioans through a network of 75,000 health care providers. And our focus is on ensuring the optimum mix of services for constituents by working across those agencies I mentioned and programmatic boundaries. The challenge which we are trying to solve is the Medicaid consumes 30% of state spending, covers 18% Ohioans, 45% of births. Since Medicaid is growing at an unsustainable rate, we do need to bend the cost curve, otherwise it would consume more of the state resources. And as I look at HIEs, the Medicaid does provide a key opportunity to bring HIE value to, to the Medicaid patients. Dr. Chaw in the morning talked about reducing healthcare costs by eliminating redundant or unnecessary testing, increasing efficiency by eliminating unnecessary paperwork and handling. The second key area of focus is improving healthcare quality and outcomes. As we look at the massive amounts of data which is collected through HIEs and EHRs, it does allow us to conduct macro analysis which does benefit the population and lower the healthcare costs over time. The other key area we're looking at is improving the prevention of chronic disease, the leading cause of death, and if we could leverage analytics to determine when an intervention is needed, 
uh, that would result in cost savings. There is one key initiative which is currently underway, the state's clinical decision support, which is run out of Office of Medicaid with Director John McCarthy. It does provide the capability to analyze the clinical information through claims and electronic health records, supports the Medicaid providers, and it documents the delivery of evidence-based practices to improve the health status of individuals on Medicaid. Uh, the phase one is going live this summer, and it will allow the Medicaid to view healthcare hotspots in Ohio, the status and treatment outcomes of individuals on Medicaid, and the performance of Medicaid providers. Our ultimate plan is to create a clinical data portal with the ability for the providers to submit clinical data and request clinical data. And ultimately, we will establish Ohio Medicaid on the HIE network and eventually the National Information Health Information Network. The second key area of focus is streamlining health and human services. One of the big, one of the key big IT project in Ohio we are working on is modernizing eligibility determination systems. The current processes for health and human services eligibility determination are complex. We have 150 categories, two separate processes to determine eligibility, and we're looking at duplication, cost inefficiencies across both state and local governments. The Health Transformation Office uh, started a project with three objectives. One is to simplify client eligibility based on income, streamlining the state, local, county responsibility when it comes to eligibility modernization, and to modernize our 30-year-old uh, COBOL application for eligibility systems technology. That should increase, increase the consumer experience and significantly reduce the cost associated with eligibility determination. And our, our go live date for that is October of 2013. As we look at the current state of technology challenges, uh, the traditional silo approach, which, which has persisted over the years in the health and human services agencies, the programs have met their individual needs but when we are trying to leverage the information across those programs to make better decisions, it doesn't work. And if you look at the trends in enhancing the health and human services programs, it's rooted in evidence-based practices where that demonstrate the patient person-centric approach is, is, is more effective in four areas, access, quality, outcomes, and cost, than the agency-centric approach. And to go towards that person-centric approach from a state perspective, we do have to develop a technological solution that can, that can meet the needs. And in that, 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 in that context, over the last year, as part of the statewide data sharing project, we did establish a viable and doable strategy to integrate information across all health and human services program. This internal state information exchange will support the protection and promotion of health and well-being at the population and client level will be based on national interoperability standards, will be aligned with the HIEs to enable the public-private partnerships, and with shared analytics and privacy controls, we think it's critical to improve the quality outcomes and costs of the state health and human services programs and services. As we look at OHIP, as we look at HealthBridge, and as we look at the state information exchange and the other HIEs, the key is the master provider index, and the master client index. And as, as we build, uh, we will have to have a federated model and work together to establish that to, to be able to link the information uh, across the various uh, information exchanges. The, the, the thing which I heard from Dan and, 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 and Dr. Wimslow, it's about public health and epidemiology information that is a tremendous value to clinicians and there are initiatives underway to align that with state HIE. The third and the last area of focus is improving the health system performance. As Dr. Wimslow mentioned, Ohio spends more per person on health care than residents in all but 17 states, but the outcomes don't reflect it. We are ranked 35 in, in health outcomes, and that was not acceptable to Governor Kasich and Governor Kasich directed Health Transformation Office to convene and engage public and private sectors to design and implement systems that pay uh, 
for value of services, not volume. The other thing, the other goal is to define and administer episode-based payments for acute medical events across Medicaid chip, Medicare, and commercially insured patients for three to five from for three to five year time frame. And that is a significant opportunity as those cases account for 70% of healthcare spending. Uh, the other thing Dr. Winsler talked about is the federal award for, for design work to improve health system performance through payment in, innovation and, and, and service delivery improvements. This $3 million SIM grant, state innovation model grant, will be used to develop evidence-based strategies that improve the health care of individuals rather than just treat diseases. Over the course of the day, we talked about patient-centric medical homes. The key, as you look at patient-centric um, medical homes, is the model of care does promote a level of partnership between patients and their primary care healthcare physicians. And it's about improving care coordination and bolster individuals' health outcomes. To really make that happen, we do have to work together to, to use the state-of-the-art tools for registries, IT, health information exchange, and other means to ensure that individuals do get appropriate care when and where they do need it. The next slide, it's about, there are state-centric services and the health and human services program all the way from behavioral health, child and family services, social services program, public health, and there is there, there needs to be a collaboration with the other entities and the, and the HIEs to ensure that, that we, are, uh, we are streamlining our conne connection to these external environments, making sure that we are working together as we build a federated MPI, Master Provider Index, Master Client Index, and we can use this information from Medicaid and public health registries, and ultimately all parties can benefit out of it. If you do need more information on this initiative, you can log on to healthtransformation.ohio.gov and you can get more information on a lot of these initiatives and the current state of where we are at. Thank you very much. long day and great program. Thank you all for staying around for the whole day. Please join us for a reception. Our guests will be here also from Taiwan, the reception in the lobby. And unless you have any questions, I think we should adjourn. Thank you. <laughs>